right now, I'm going to mute everyone's mics, and then I'm going to jump into the um, jump into the presentation. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to work through the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about lenses, and we're going to talk about the whys of lenses. And uh, if that sounds kind of strange, um, uh, it is because most people don't talk about the whys of lenses, if you will. They they talk about how to use a lens. And they talk about the optics and they do all that kind of stuff. But have you ever asked yourself why? In other words, why do I choose one lens over another? And that's what we're going to talk about uh, for the first half. And then the second half, we're going to look at about three or four different um, compositional techniques that will help you improve your imaging if you use these things. Uh, we should be seeing right now the question is uh, the why of lenses. It's not really a question, it's a statement, but it's the why of lenses. And I think this is a, like I said a minute ago, this is a very, very important question that a lot of people just do not really ask. Um, I think what happens is people will, they, they have this, this understanding that a, a telephoto lens is to bring something that's far away up close. A wide angle lens is to take something that's, um, that is broad and be able to capture it like a landscape or something. And then everything else in between is just kind of whatever kind of fits your fancy. And, and you know, where the base concept of that is true. In other words, a telephoto does indeed bring things far away up close. And yes, indeed, a wide angle lens does cover a, a vast uh, horizon of, of places. But that alone is, is by far uh, probably the, the least reason why you should actually use one of these lenses. And, and so let's get into that and why. So let's start with telephotos. Uh, this is the uh, great, big, beautiful, I think this is the 200 uh, F2. I'm not sure. Uh, Kenny, do you know which one that is? Anyway, doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just an example of a telephoto. So let's go on. So when, one of the things that happens when, when people talk about telephoto lenses and inevitably, in fact, I would, I would guess that most people in this group right now, if you were to say, you know, what is it about a telephoto lens that you like? People say, well, I like the way it makes things all blurry in the background. And I also like the compression that it gives. And this is a great example of what, uh, of a picture that people would use to talk about compression. Okay. So this is a picture taken in, in Srinagar, Kashmir. This is Hazrat Bal Mosque. And, or it's a shrine actually, uh, but it's also a mosque, but it's Hazrat Bal, um, and, and behind it is Hari Parbat, uh, which is a, a castle um, built in the time of uh, King Akbar. And that's about two miles, maybe three miles away from this, hot this uh, mosque. And then in the far background is the Pir Panjal range. And that, those are trees, okay? You can see each individual tree on the mountain there. Now those trees, I mean that that mountain right range right there is about twenty to thirty miles away. All right, so people will look at this picture and go, "Well, first of all, is it fake?" And no, it's not fake. It was taken, <clears throat> excuse me, it was taken early morning on a um, on a March morning. It was very, very, very clear. And in fact, it was probably so clear that there was probably some sort of refraction or something happening in the atmosphere. Um, uh, I don't know how that works or couldn't even tell you, but it was just amazingly clear. And I used a um, 300 millimeter lens or 400 millimeter. I don't even remember now. It was a many, many years ago. It was a Sigma lens at the time. And, um, but it was uh, cropped everything. And Anyway, it just it just really made this feel of compression. The problem is, there is no such thing as compression, and and people will have been debating this. And reality is, there is no compression effect in a telephoto lens. Now you're going to say, "No, I know there is," and it's like, "Well, all right, let's look at this. I'm going to prove it to you." Okay, so here's a 2.8 uh, f 2.8. I'm, I'm sorry, here's a 28 millimeter lens shot at f2.8, all right? So this is the scene. This is um, taken in the north side of, of, of Everest. This is Everest Bates Camp on the Tibet side, all right? So 
uh, I was standing on a hill and I had this wide angle lens and I shot the scene and I thought that's nice, but the mountain just isn't impressive, right? So that's Everest in the background. And so I thought I will use a telephoto and I will, I'll use it to, to really create compression and to make that mountain bigger and everything. So, um, I used a 70 millimeter. I didn't, I couldn't even use because we were so close to the mountain. I couldn't even use the 200, but I used the 70 on my telephoto. And this is the shot I got. Now everybody looks at this and says, yep, it worked. There's compression there, right? I think most people would agree that that looks like compression to you until, until you take this image and superimpose it. It's shot at F 2.8, by the way. Uh, and you superimpose this onto the other lens, the other shot at 28 millimeter, and this is what you get. So now you can see that there really isn't any compression. It's just a crop. And, and so that feel of compression that you're getting, now there is definitely, um, there is definitely, uh, aspect changes, uh, all kinds of things because of, of distortion and, and, and um, things like this. That's the reason like the tents and everything don't line up exactly perfect. But I managed to get the mountain and, and the hills and everything line it up so that you can actually see that in reality, there really isn't compression. It's a misnomer. It's a, it's a misunderstanding of how these lenses work. So then why on earth do we want to shoot that? Why not just get a, a GFX 100 with 100 megapixels and then just crop down? Well, you could actually, because I mean, you could. But we use telephoto lenses, as we said before, to get things far away up close, but we also use it to isolate a picture and isolate an image uh, or a subject. And so, so here's a great example. Here's a, a portrait of a man actually in Tibet. and and by using a telephoto lens, we get so close to him and we, we crop in nice and close that you, you don't see the context. You don't see the environment. You don't see the things around. And, and it, it, so it is, in effect, isolating your subject. All right. Here's another example. So I took this at a, uh, at a temple here in Penang that I believe was the Mercy Temple. I'm not sure, but anyway, but it's a temple here in Penang. And there were a ton of people in praying and, and doing their jaw sticks and everything. And if you know anything, and all of our Malaysian Chinese friends know this, uh, because you can see right there all these different jaw sticks that are there. So you know there's a lot of people there, right? These things don't just appear by themselves. And as soon as they're there for, for probably three, four minutes, a guy comes around and collects them all and then throws them away. So, so we know there's a lot of people here. And yet, because I shot it with this telephoto lens, it isolated him and it made it feel, um, it just gave it a whole different feeling. And that's what you really want to think through is what is it you want to communicate? What does that lens make the viewer feel? Okay. And so a telephoto lens will, isolate your subject. Now, one of the things you have to be very, very careful with with a telephoto lens is that it can create a sense of, of voyeurism. And in, by voyeurism, what I mean is, is that it can both actually cause you to act very voyeuristic, but it can also give a, an image and make it feel voyeuristic. Um, and so, so here is an image of a lady sitting and talking. She's unaware of me. Uh, I did like the juxtaposition between the, the statue um, on the right and her there, and then the leading lines and the repetition. However, there is a sense of, of her being so, so unaware and oblivious to me that it was, it's almost a creepy feel. And, uh, and so you have to be very, very careful of that kind of thing. Now this image, some people say it feels that way. Some other people say, no, it doesn't. Um, honestly, I, I, I'm just, and I don't trying to be prideful here. I, this is such an important factor for me when I use a telephoto lens that I, um, that I, 
I really am very, very careful not to shoot pictures that look sort of voyeuristic. And this, I was digging through all my pictures trying to find something. And this is, this is the, the other one and this one are the only two that I could find. Um, but you have to be careful of that. Now, um, we're going to talk about ultra wide lenses or basically wide angle lenses, but especially ultra wide because that's what I love to shoot. And it's my favorite lens is the ultra wide. And now why is that? Well, all right. So what we talked about before, and it is true, ultra wide lenses um, will allow you to take a vast landscape and to capture it. Right. And it, and it really does a beautiful job, as you can see here, of, of showing the environment. OK, that's great, except there's a whole lot more to it. So one of the things that it does is it gives you a sense of space, especially if you include a human form or a person in the image, because then it gives it perspective and you can realize, oh, my gosh, that guy is dwarfed by the vastness of the scene. The other thing is if the telephoto is, is exclusive, and in other words, it excludes everything but your subject, then the wide angle is the exact opposite. It is inclusive. The wide angle lens includes the environment. It includes other people. It includes uh, just everything that's in the frame will be brought within the view of, of the photographer will, will be put into that. And so you have to be careful that you can actually have unwanted things in the photo, but it's also, it works to your advantage by allowing you to, um, to actually help tell a story. And so the wide angle lens is, is like the go-to lens for visual storyteller. Because it, it allows the photographer to bring in context. And context is so important in any story that you tell, whether visual or otherwise. Um, and so by, by actually uh, shooting very wide, uh, you will, you can, for instance, in this picture, you see the candles in the front, you see the bow of the boat, you see the river, you see the seagulls. And as you go back, you know, you got layer upon layer upon layer, you have the city in the background. And then if you're familiar at all with, with, um, with uh, especially Muslim architecture, you can tell pretty quickly that that, that building right above the Sadhu's head is a, an old mosque. And so there's a juxtaposition between the, the Hindu sadhu and the Muslim mosque and then the river and all this kind of stuff. So this, this, the image is just full of information that if I would have used the telephoto would have been lost. Again, context, environment. Um, it, 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 people oftentimes find it silly when I say, when people say, what's your favorite portrait lens? And they expect me to say 85 millimeter 1.2 or something like that. And what I say is uh, usually my ultra wide, whatever, whatever it is that I'm using at that time. 16 to 35 is one that, um, that I always loved when I was shooting Canon. Uh, and in, in Fuji, I used the 1024. Um, and, and so this is my go-to lens. This is the lens that I love the most uh, because it creates... An, a, a complete scene here. Now, again, if you have any questions, jump in, all right? I don't mind answering, stopping and answering questions. So um, go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, here's a scene, uh, and imagine this shot with a telephoto. If you would have uh, shot this man. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, uh, I have to, uh, there is a question from Mark. Okay. Yeah, he's asking you um, on why and when prime lenses for X-T2. I guess he's, he's using X-T2 right now. Just want to know that uh, why and when we should use the prime lens. Okay, a prime lens generally is used uh, because it's faster than other lenses. And when we talk about fast, what we're talking about is the the f number or the f stop on the lens. A prime lens will generally, like a, um, a sixteen prime with Fuji, it is a one point four lens. I mean, one point four f stop wide open, and uh, and that allows a lot of light so that you can handhold it and shoot it in low light situations. Okay, um, other prime lenses like the thirty five is a um, I believe it's a one point four as well. You have the fifty six, which is a one point two. Uh, all these lenses are primes, and and 
and um, they tend to primes just tend to be a lot faster. It used to be in the old days that a prime lens was also sharper. But frankly, with Fuji lenses, I have found that not to be necessarily the case. And not that they're not sharp, but that a but that the that the zoom lenses are every bit as sharp. Um, and um, the only time you get softening would be on the very very edges, and only on a few of them. Um, that most of these lenses are incredibly sharp all the way through. In fact, I'm sometimes they're almost too sharp. Um, lenses can be too sharp in a sense, and and so. Um, it's uh they're 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 amazing oops looks like i have okay well um all right so let's go so what i was saying with this is that is that if you shot this with a telephoto you would get the man coming through the door and that's about it you'd have very little context involved here and so um you would see his pants and you'd say oh he's wearing red pants that's interesting uh, and then you'd see his his regular Western style shirt, and then you see that he's wearing a tika or a, a, a you know a spot on his forehead. And you go, oh, okay, he must be Hindu. But there really wouldn't be much much context. You wouldn't know for a fact that this picture was taken in India. It could have been taken at a, you know some Hindu in Malaysia or a Hindu in who knows where, you know? Um, but when you shoot it with a wide angle, and this was probably taken with a 14 millimeter, then all of a sudden you have the elephant on the wall, you have the Hindi script up on the blackboard there, and then you have the, uh, the ohm on the far right, uh, far left of the corner. And all of a sudden this context fills in this whole picture. And the context is every bit as important as the man in this picture. Okay, a, a wide angle lens can be very intimate. And I know that sounds so strange because wide angle lenses, you, you would think you would use that expression for a telephoto where you're zooming really close up to people, right? Well, a wide angle lens is intimate, not as much in the photo itself, which it is, it can be, but it's the experience of the photographer using the wide angle lens. And now, bet you didn't think I'd be talking about this, but the photographer, when he puts a wide angle lens on his camera, he has to get closer to his subject. Now, you can get too close and get distortion. We're talking about that in just a second, but you still have to get close. And as you get close to do a portrait, um, you you start invading personal space and that is and we're going to talk about that in a second as well but that creates an intimacy between you and the subject and so this subject there's no way people say well did that guy allow you to take his picture <laughs> obviously there's no way that i could get you know a, a one foot away from him or whatever i was two feet away from him and take this picture without him knowing it this isn't like a telephoto that I can take this thing in autonomy across the street. That's the, that's the amazing and, and I think the beauty of a, a wide angle lens. There's another example. I was literally laying on my belly while this guy was sweeping and I took this picture. And, and so it, I was inches, inches away from his broom. In fact, I think he thought I was completely out of my mind. Um, but the fact is, it created an amazing picture um, that, um, that I think wouldn't have happened if I would have shot it with anything but a wide angle. Okay, and the other thing that wide angles do, you can see I'm obsessing over wide angles because it's my favorite lens, but, uh, but the other thing a wide angle does is it works with perspective. And um, it, it can work for you and it can work against you. But you can, take uh, you can take lines that are parallel lines and use a wide angle and they become, uh, they become leading lines, they become diagonal lines, they, um, and, it's, and you get uh, a wide line going to a narrow line. You, uh, using a wide angle lens to take a picture of railroad tracks is always fun because you have this, this wide base and all of a sudden it just zoops off into the, into the distance. And you, it really, it exaggerates perspective. And so it gives a, a real interesting uh, sense to a picture that adds to the storytelling. Now, 
Here's the thing you have to be careful of though, is, is that when you get really close, uh, you start to have distortion. Now I'm gonna pause here for one question, one quick, because apparently, um, I don't know why, but I, I'm on do not disturb, but I'm, but I'm getting these uh, Yes, Matt, hi, yeah. I have a question. Please. Uh -huh. This is uh, MJ from Malaysia. Okay. So currently I have uh, an X3, XT100 with uh, the Super EBC XC 15, 45 millimeter and 3.5, 5.6 F-stops. So I adore all the pictures that you just share with us, a couple of photos, street photos, mm -hmm. I think are marvelous. So I'm wondering before I um, decide to invest on the new lens, um, may I know what would be the difference if I'm using the 15, 45 millimeter um, uh, lens mm -hmm. and uh, I mean like I, I use this lens to take all this photo and I, may I know what's the difference between the wide angle and the lens that well, I the have 15, right now? The 15 to 45 is, um, it, 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 15 is a nice wide that's a, that, that's that's nice and wide, okay. And so you're gonna you're gonna have the spectrum between 15 and 45. 45 is gonna be, uh, I'm not really good at math here, but I, if a 56 is like an 85, then obviously a 45 is gonna be probably like a 50, 60 millimeter or something like that lens. Um, but the, um, but. Uh, the the thing is is you said that your the lowest f stop you had was five point six is that right? That is three point five five point six yes. Yeah, three point five five point six. Okay, so three point five. So so that's that was what I was talking about. Where a prime lens or even a more expensive lens, uh, um, um, you can get um, you can get the uh, a faster lens. In other words, a two point eight on that or maybe even a 1.4. And, um, and so if you were to switch to the, the better lens and get away from that, that um, I believe that's one of those plastic kit lenses. I'm not sure, I've never used that lens. Yes, yes it um, is. Yeah, uh, and then you upgrade to one of the, the, like the metal glass lenses, then all of a sudden you're gonna, you're gonna find yourself being able to be a lot more versatile about when you can take pictures, okay? All right, so let's go on. So distortion is what they have to be careful of, uh, but it also can, you can use it. Uh, you can use it to exaggerate and you can use it to create comical images, uh, but you can, and you can use it to accentuate. For instance, this man holding a durian, uh, I wanted to focus the picture on the durian and have the man uh, there, but, but the durian takes up the majority of the frame because they're using a wide angle and it, and it created, I use that distortion for that purpose. Okay. But you have to be careful speaking of durian um, because you don't want to get durian on your lens because you're going to invade personal space. When you start shooting a wide angle and you're getting up close, like I was saying, you're going to get very intimate with your subject and, and you know, you get durian on it. <laughs> so, and then lastly, I want to talk quickly about the normal lens. And this is a term we don't use much nowadays. We use it in the film days a lot. And that's where I come from. You can tell my age because I use this term. Uh, and that's the 50 millimeter or the 35 millimeter um, on a crop sensor. And what that is, is um, really it's equivalent. It's the closest lens that we have that, that equates to what the eye sees. Um, it's not exactly, but but it's it's pretty close to what the eye sees, and so and so people use this, and they use it sort of for that that everyday go-to lens because it 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 is what they see, and it reproduces uh, pretty much what what their eyes are seeing, and it's a great lens, but honestly, for me. It isn't. Um, it isn't overwhelming. You know, it's like it's like it's good to have it, but um, but it's not going to it's not going to be, you know, um, my necessarily go to lens. All right. Speaking of go to, we're gonna do a little thing here. We're gonna do into breakout, and we're gonna get into groups. And I'm gonna put everybody into a group. And and when you're in a group, um, 
you're going to be asked this question. What is your favorite go-to lens and why? Okay, and we're going to spend probably five to ten minutes talking about that. The question is, what is your favorite go-to lens and why? Okay, so for me, I said it over and over again, my favorite go-to lens was the was the wide angle. So, but maybe you have a very specific lens, like 35 millimeter. I know a lot of people love 35. A lot of people love 105. So what is it for you? What is your favorite go-to lens and, and why? And let's, uh, I'm gonna give you at least five, maybe even a little bit longer time, uh, depending on how, how long these people get in their groups. All right, so get ready, get set and go. All right, so let's, uh, all right, so we're gonna move on now. Also, um, if you haven't already, sign up for my mailing list. So you do that, you go to the digitaltrekker.com and you hit enter and then you'll be taken to this page where you'll enter your name and you uh, will enter your email address and then hit the subscribe button and you will be uh, updated as to when we have all of these great uh, interviews and workshops, all free, all for you. And now let's go on. Composition and visual interest. This is an interesting topic because so many people want to just think that composition is a matter of uh, knowing the rule of thirds, whacking your subject onto the third line and get on with it. Okay. Well, there's a whole lot more to it. And so we're going to talk about that. And there's a couple of things that I think is so fascinating. So I'm a member of the National Press Photographers Association in the U.S. And one of the things that I got as a result of it was um, a study that they, uh, that, that the, uh, that the NPPA did, and they hired a, a lady named Sarah Quinn, who was a part of a organization um, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, it's in my notes and I'll get it in a second. But, um, but what they did is they, they took a, a group of people and they split these people up and they, they took um, half the group were digital natives. In other words, they were born into the digital world. And the other half were what they call digital immigrants and people that like myself who are, are people that were born in the non-digital world but have immigrated into the digital world. And they, and they had them... Uh, work with some special software and they had them look at a hundred, maybe 200 pictures. I don't remember exactly. And so this is an actual photo of, of the event. And so this guy is looking at the screen and as he's watching the screen, they have eye tracking software that actually watches his eyes and tracks it on the screen. And when it tracks, here's exactly what happens. This is, this is what the back end of it looks like. When the person looks, as long as they look at something, the the bigger the dot is, and then it traces the eye um, from the next to the next place the eye looks, and then if it stays there, it will it will get a bigger dot the longest it stays there, and then if it moves, then it um, it will be a smaller dot, you know, for less time, and so on and so forth. And so this is the actual pattern that viewers had when they watched this image. Isn't this interesting? So you can see that they, they focused in on the face of the man and then they looked down here at the, at the caption. Now, um, while they were watching this, they also had questions asked them, okay? They asked, uh, the, the question was, was this photograph taken by a professional photojournalist or not? All right, reality is half the photos were taken by professional photojournalists and the other half were taken by what they call um, consumer generated images. Uh, and so these are images taken by just the average Joe on their iPhones or with their point and shoot cameras or whatever. And, but they're not professionals. And then they were submitted. So these were uh, user generated. Okay. Then they asked them, uh, oh, well in this thing, they had the, the they had all of the, the, the information except the, the, uh, the, the publication. Okay. Uh, and, but they had the caption as it was originally published and the photographer's name. And then they asked them about the quality of the image. They said from one being not so great to five being great. And then what was the likelihood of sharing this photo? Now, you got to understand that this was that this uh, whole research was funded by uh, by a, uh, the the uh, National Press Photographers Association because they 
they had a feeling that there was a difference, and to me it's obvious, that there's a difference between a professional photo and a non-professional photo. And, but they wanted to know is, is this, and this is the key question, is this photo likely to be shared? Because for a publication, sharing an image means everything, okay? And for us living on social media, that's everything, right? And so now the interesting thing that happened with this is this study ended up validating things that I've been teaching for years. And yet it, I, it was all, for me, it was all anecdotal. But now all of a sudden, after watching this survey or reading the survey and looking at the data that came out of the survey, all of this stuff that I knew anecdotally is now actually verified through research. So um, I want you to, to look at some of these stats that came through. So what they found out that people were able to identify a professionally taken photo 90% of the time. 90% of the time they could look at a photo and say, yep, that one's professional versus that one that was user generated content. Okay. Now this to me is the fascinating part. And this is the thing that I was saying really validated things that I've been teaching. I've always said that, that, uh, that the human form trumps everything in a photograph, no matter what's in the photo, your eyes always go to a human form. You know what? It's true because what they found out is that there's that faces that people's eyes went to people's faces 36% of the time. Then they went to captions 33% of the time. Now, why did they go to captions 33% of the time? You remember this is time wise, right? Not like first here, then there, this is time. Now time is because captions take a time to read, right? So two Mongolian brothers race their ponies against each other in their backyard, okay? That takes time to read. And so that's why that's 33% of the time. Now, this is interesting. They look at the bodies of, of figures 14% of the time. Add 14% to 36%, you get 50% of the time people are looking at the human form in a photo more than anything else in the photo details 10% of the time, and then everything else 7% of the time. Reality is, and this is what I've been teaching for years, human form trumps everything. Doesn't matter if there's a face, the human form trumps everything. If you put a human in your picture, people are going to look at that human. Now, it doesn't matter if it's taken with an iPhone like this, or if it's taken with a fancy camera, reality is human form trumps everything. Now, you can accentuate the human form by adding bright color to it, by adding contrast, by making it larger, smaller, whatever, uh, but nevertheless, human form trumps everything in a photo. So, remember that because if you got a human, if, you're, if you wanted to take a picture of this tree and you want your tree to be your main subject, your human form is going to actually be distraction. Now, in the human form, they go to the eyes first, and then, remember we talked about the face, I'm sorry, they go to the face first and then the eyes, and that's what that, that's what that, that survey said, okay? So, um, now, so if this is the case, this is why so many photographers always teach you, um, you need to make sure that if you focus on a face, you focus on the eyes because people are going to go to the eyes first. And so you need those eyes to be nice and sharp and focused. Now, if you look at this picture, the first thing you look at is that guy throwing the baseball. All right. Now, that is proven because this is actually one of the images that they used in their survey and they had people look at this and everybody looked at that baseball picture. All right. And that, so it, this isn't just in one image. This is also for web design. This is for, this is for uh, newspaper, newsprint, whatever. If there's a human form, your eyes are going to go to that first. 
Then they took a picture like this and they had everybody just look at these images. And as their eyes moved across this frame, they quickly went across the football, they quickly went across the, the global warming map. What they did is they looked at the cop, they looked at the kid, they looked at the baseball player, they looked at the lady's face, and that's what they focused on. Here's another picture shot with an iPhone. Your eyes go directly to the mirror. Why? Because his face is there. Yeah, there's a human form with a guy with a, with, on the bicycle. There's the guy taking up half the frame practically on the, on the right side. And yet you're looking at his face and you're looking at his eyes. So remember that as you compose your pictures. Here, the first thing you see is this man's face. Then where do your eyes go? They go over to the Buddha. Human form doesn't have to be a, a, a organic human being. It can be a statue because we're talking human form. Now, there's a lot of other things that play in this image, a lot of other things that play in this image, but the main thing is the human form. Now, we do talk about Rule of thirds. Everybody's always teaching and preaching rule of thirds. And, you know, rule of thirds is good. And I use it a lot. I mean, you see, I use it in this picture, okay? I use it subconsciously more than I do consciously. Um, I, I, I actually, we're going to talk about something a little bit later in this, uh, where I talk about prescription versus description. And uh, realistically, for me, it's a descriptive thing. I look at my images afterwards, and I realize, oh, I shot this with using the rule of thirds. Um, however, with that in mind, it is a, a legitimate and good way to frame a, a picture. It creates interest. It, you know, traditionally, it, you know, the whole idea of the rule of thirds evolves out of the whole Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio, and all this can be traced uh, back even before we coined this term rule of thirds. Now, one of the things that people hate about the rule of thirds, and I think it is because, because really, it really comes down to that term rule. And as we're seeing these days, nobody likes to be told what to do, right? Nobody likes to be told you have to wear your mask. You know, nobody likes to be told you can't tell me I'm an individual, blah, 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 blah. And so they get, they, they, their, their hackles get raised when you say rule of thirds. Okay. Let's get that out of the way. It's not a rule. That's not the whole point. What it's saying is it's more like when you say a law of nature, it's not a law. Nobody passed a law. It's just, it's a principle that is there and you can't really help it. And the rule of thirds is the fact that if you frame your subject on one of these, these power points, as it says, um, then, then it will have a dynamic resonance to it. It will have movement to it. It will, it will be less static, okay, and more, more uh, engaging. That's just the fact, and that's why it's a rule. I sometimes call it a, a, a suggestion of thirds because you know what? You don't have to use it. No one's saying it's not a rule that you have to use. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be used with people. It can be used in stationary objects like this. Um, but again, this is the, the, the least probably, it's the most used and maybe even overused thing is this rule of thirds. But it's very closely related to one of my favorite techniques, and that's negative space. Now, negative space is interesting because for the longest time, I had a hard time trying to put words into what is negative space. You know, how do I explain what negative space is? I use it and I understand its power, but I don't know how to put it into words to explain it. And then it dawned on me one time that negative space, the power of negative space is the fact that it is nothing. The fact that it pushes, that the emptiness of that negative space pushes the viewer into the details. In other words, because there's nothing in the sky, there is no horizon line, there is nothing besides the sun in this sky, the viewer is obliged to look at the boat. They are obliged to look at the, the land. And that is their eyes are forced to look at those things. That's the power of negative space. 
Now, negative space doesn't have to be completely empty. I think a lot of people have that misconception of what negative space is. Here we see negative space working throughout the image, and yet what does it do? It creates this beautiful um, excuse to, 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 to focus in on both the empty chair and the man. So the man's sitting there in the chair, your eyes go from there undistracted with nothing in the way except popping right on over to the empty chair. You look at the empty chair, your eyes start going all over the chair, you go down to the legs and you see that crazy spring and then the, the, little, um, the little piece of stone that, that levels out the chair and it's just visually interesting, right? And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, there's a part of the chair on the floor there. Oh, that must be a part of the chair the guy's sitting on because there's no back to that chair. That must be the back. And then you realize your eyes, you don't realize this, but if you think about it, you realize that your eyes are not going anywhere else in the frame because there isn't any place for them to go. That's the beauty of negative space. Here, this was shot uh, early morning, very much like that one, the blue scene of the, the canoe. Here, this is on Varanasi on a morning, but it was misty morning. And so you don't see the, the horizon, you don't see the other side of the river, um, but you see these two, these three children in a boat fishing and this graceful lines of, of him pulling up his net. And, and you've got this beautiful leading line, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, of, of the net going right up to the boy. Now, why do, you, why do you look at the boy? Well, you have the leading line going up to the boy, and then you have actually his reflection, which actually acts as another leading line, and then you have nothing else in the frame to look at. That's the beauty of negative space. Negative space is, is extremely powerful. Now, it's also extremely useful. Publishers love negative space. And this is why I guess a lot of them like to use me because I like to use negative space. So here you can see this picture of a guy riding a bicycle. So it's a great place to stick in a message, right, um, on, on copy. You know, you can put copy in that negative space. So here we have uh, a Maasai and boom, text goes here. text goes here. Now, this I'm putting in here just because I think it's funny, it's ironic, because I shot this with negative space in mind, right? So I shot it her off center on that sort of that third line, giving it negative space because there's nothing there. And then, and then I get a call from Sachi and Sachi and they say, hey, we want to use this for a big campaign we're doing. I'm thinking, great, you're going to put all this copy over here. And what do they do? They end up actually using the other side, which isn't, wasn't even there, and they had to Photoshop it in and create negative space to, uh, to put their text in. Uh, and so, but anyway, it was, like I said, but negative space can also be used like for uh, headlines. So here is a, an article I did for uh, KLM, and, uh, and this was um, shooting down in... Um, uh, in the tea fields in uh, in Malaysia here. Okay, another really really powerful uh, compositional tool is uh, what we've been talking about already a little bit is leading lines or diagonal lines. So here we have a lady who is a human form sitting in this dark window on a train. Now. It's interesting is that, yes, it's a human form. You really don't know it except for the elbow and the hands that it's a human, right? We don't see her face. We don't see a head, really. We see sort of a shoulder. But your eyes are still going to that lady immediately. Why is that? Well, there's several things at play here. Contrast. We have repetition with the windows. And, um, and, and actually, we have, uh, we have in using those windows, there's a perspective gain from a smaller on the right over to larger on the left. Uh, but the biggest factor are these lines. These lines are creating leading lines right to that lady. So you have the power of the human form plus those leading lines. Your eyes can't go anywhere. That's the only place they can go. Somebody said that, that all storytelling is manipulation. And I think that's true, and I think visual storytelling is 
just as manipulative in the sense of that what we do is that we, if we're forming, if we're using composition the way we should, if we're, if we're, if we're working with an image the way we should, then we can place the viewer's eyes where we want them in the frame. So here, your eyes go directly to the top of that spire on this uh, stupa. So this is in Kathmandu, shot with an iPhone. And yet, why, can, why do your eyes go there immediately? Because of the leading lines, because of the prayer flags going up there. All these things act as, as powerful forces that drive your eyes right up to the top of that, that, top of that, um, that stupa. So here we have the human form and a statue form and your eyes go right to his eyes and you're looking right at his face. You look at his smile, his nose, and then eventually you get over to those funky ears. But you look around the frame, there's nothing to see except lines going right back to him. So here you have a combination of negative space and leading lines and human form. Very strong. You cannot do anything but look at that guy. Here, I, what I find is my eyes actually hit that first focal point where that, that uh, main pole is in the middle and then immediately go to her. But they don't go to her right away. Uh, I, now, that part of that might be, it'd be interesting to know from you if your eyes went to the lady right away. Because for me, I've seen this picture so many, you know, millions of times that I'm wondering if it's because I've seen it so much that my eyes go to that post first. But nevertheless, these lines still work towards pushing you right to that lady. And then once you get to the lady, you really are, are captured with her. And by the way, the sign in the background gives context, right? So you see, you see the, the, the script up there and you realize, oh, this is in some sort of South Asian country, it happens to be Nepal. Now here your eyes go to the child and then from that child up to the second child, why? Well, because your eyes hit that child and then the lines all take you up and if your eyes were to actually follow that other, that other route up to the left, it'll take you right back down to that child. And so your eyes go back and forth between the two children. Two reasons, one, human form, faces, but also leading lines. Rarely does a photograph have only one concept of, of, of uh, you know, uh, composition. Usually there's several things that play in an image. Okay. Now, what I've been talking about is very prescriptive. Okay. So I'm telling you, and I'm going to define these two terms, prescriptive and descriptive. Now, prescriptive defines what should be. Okay. So a great example of that is a, uh, a, a speed limit sign. Okay. So here in Malaysia, we use the, the kilometers per hour. So this is a, the typical 50 kilometer an hour speed limit sign. Okay, so that's telling you, that's prescriptive. That's saying you can't go more than 50 kilometers an hour. Okay, now descriptive, on the other hand, is a speedometer. Um, a speedometer tells you, it, it, it's an observation of what is. It tells you what's happening. It's telling you you're going 80 kilometers an hour. Okay, uh, and so, or, or 80 miles an hour, I guess, on this. But, uh, but anyway, but it's telling you you're going 80. And what you should be doing is going to 50. You see, so, so you've got the difference between prescriptive, defining what should be, versus descriptive, defining what is. Now, how does that work with photography and how does that work with what we've been talking about? Well, when we talk about all this stuff, I give you all these different compositional, not rules, but suggestions and, and, and concepts and ideas to help you up your game, okay? Uh, these are prescriptive. Now, that means that when you go out to the field, you're going to go, okay, I got to remember, I have to uh, frame it this way, put them on the rule of thirds, or I need to use negative space, or I need leading lines, or frame within a frame, or, or whatever I'm going to be doing. Okay, so that's prescriptive. But you know what? Reality is, a lot of times, you're not going to remember that, right? I mean, this is a lot to remember. And these are only like three or four different things. I've got literally probably 50 things that I could give you that would help your composition. But that's just too much. It's just going to overwhelm you. That's why I only gave you a few things. Because if you can master just those few things, you'll be doing, you'll be really upping your game. However, 
This is prescriptive. Now, what I want you to do though, is I want you to go home and I want you to look at your images. I want you to go back to your Lightroom or whatever it is that you've got that you're, you're working with your pictures in, Photoshop, Lightroom, whatever. And I want you to look at your image. Remember this image? I want you to look at it and go, okay, let's look at this descriptive. Let's describe, let's observe what's going on in this frame, okay? My eyes immediately go to the guy and the face and then from there to the other face. Why? Okay, because human form right? And what do you look at first? The, f the face of the human form. Okay, here we go. Human form. And again, the face. All right, now what else is happening here? Why, why does when my eyes move around the frame, I keep coming back to that guy and that Buddha? Well, because you have all these lines going back to him. Okay, this is descriptive. You're looking at this picture and you're thinking, why is this work? Why does this picture work? Okay. And then you go, Oh, you know what? Also, I've got a little bit of negative space here because I look over here, there's nothing here. And so my eyes just continue to go back. Okay. So that's prescriptive, meaning what you should do, you know, things you can do versus descriptive, looking at the things you've already done at your images and looking at maybe your whole Lightroom catalog going, okay, why does this image work? Why does this image not work? Okay. We're going to go to great breakout groups one more time. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to talk about what is your fallback sort of compositional technique and why do you use it all the time? For me, I already said it's negative space. I, I really, really fall back into using negative space a lot. I mean, a lot. I was talking to my sister today and she's like, oh my gosh, yes, you use it all the time. So negative space. So why do I do that? Well, I don't know. There's a, there's a, for when you use negative space, there's also a sense of tranquility that happens a lot of times, a sense of, of calmness. And a lot of my images have a sense of calmness to it. And then the other thing is, is that um, I do a lot of publications. And so, and so people need that negative space to put uh, text in. So, uh, so we're going to break now into, into groups. Remember the question is, so uh, what, is your fallback compositional sort of technique. It may not be something we talked about, okay? It can be, it can be a frame within a frame. It can be light over dark. It can be um, all kinds of different compositional things. What is it that you use? Uh, is it heavy use of, of triangles or graphics or, 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 you know, whatever? Okay, so we're gonna go in and, uh, and we're gonna spend another five, 10 minutes talking about that and you're gonna be assigned a room and here we go. Now, who had the question? Somebody asked a question? Matt, I got a question. This is Bipin. My question is like when you showed that image about leading lines with the Buddha statue and that other guy. Mm -hmm. So when I looked, I could just look at the two guys. Now, so this lines, when you are capturing the image, you could visualize it that the arm would become a line or that's something you saw subsequent yeah. after the image. Okay. So that's exactly my point about prescriptive versus descriptive. Okay. Prescriptive would be okay, I'm forming that, I got that, I wanna see that line going there, I wanna use those lines. Now that does happen, it does happen, and I do shoot that way. Um, and, and I specifically shot that picture low over the, over the little candles with the Buddha in the background, knowing that people would be coming in, because I, I, I observed, um, and I think this is a, a thing that people are missing a lot. And that's this idea of, of observe your surroundings. You know, in other words, understand what's transpiring and watch the way people move. Are people coming and lighting candles and then leaving, coming and lighting candles and leaving, coming and lighting candles and leaving? If they are, then you can prepare for that shot. And that's what I did. So I saw people coming, lighting candles and leaving. So I got the camera low and I knew they were going to be coming and they were coming in, light it. I didn't know it'd be a guy. I didn't know exactly how he was going to do his arm, all that kind of stuff. But, um, but he came in, he lit the candles and I took three or four shots of he, while he was doing it. And, uh, and I always take more than one shot because you know, you can miss focus. You can do all that kind of stuff. Cause you're not, you're uh, when you're shooting like that, that camera's not to your eye. You're, you're using the flip up screen on that camera to take that picture. Cause it's, it's low. It's right over the top of these candles. Right. So, uh, but I, I purposely put the Buddha there. I purposely had 
um, the candles in the frame like that. So, so it was a little bit of mix of both, but then getting into Lightroom, I looked at frame one, two, three, four, and five, and then realized that one was the most powerful. And then you, then I asked myself, why is it the most powerful? Well, it's because of the leading lines. It's because of the negative space. It's because of the human form. It's all those things. So that, that's where both prescriptive and descriptive work together, combining to make a, a pretty darn good image. Well, that's very helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, now's the time when we want to do ask questions. If you have questions, uh, feel free to, to open your mic up and ask away. And if I can't answer it, I'll just get Bobby to answer it. So, uh, so if you got a question, go ahead. Anybody? Yes, um, me? Yeah, sure, uh, go ahead. I have a quick question. I think uh, you were using on the Buddha picture, you were using a wide angle sort of a lens, right? Yeah. So yep. Because I can see that the, you, you fit in a lot of stories and uh -huh. leading lines. Uh -huh. That's the whole purpose of a ultra wide lens. Some right. of the approaches that I use, uh, for right. example, if I don't uh, have uh, the leading line or composition right, I will get a, just a position, it's two contrasting things, either in the background uh -huh. or foreground to make things up more interestingly. This okay. can be easily done with wide angle. I can, I can see your approach right. is, is heading that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, so what I said earlier um, in, when we were talking about lenses is that my go-to lens is an is a ultra-wide. Um, and, and that's the reason is because of everything you just said. Um, you, you know, I, again, I, and I think people just get their jaw drops when they ask me this and, and, and I, or when I answer this, they say, what is your favorite portrait lens? And I'll say like, a, a you know, um, a 10 to 24. And they're like, what? How can you take a portrait of 10 to 24? It's like, dude, that's all my portraits are done with. And it's because I'm taking environmental portraits. I'm taking, I'm taking a full story with a man sitting in the midst of all this stuff. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's these kind of pictures that, that, you, um, that you get with, with a, a, a wide angle lens, you know, you, um, you know, so, so here's, here's the, Here's a, a, a an ultra wide angle lens. So I have the man sitting in the rickshaw, and I and I sat here probably for 20 minutes shooting this picture of of rickshaws and taxis going by because I wanted to tell a story of how the pull rickshaws were not being used as much anymore, and they were being overcome by the cycle rickshaws and the taxis. Okay, uh, but you couldn't have done this with a telephoto lens. You know, um, the this idea of of this man uh, sitting in his junk shop with all these radiator fans, you know, is fun as all of this, the repetition of the circles and the fans and the and the contrast, the the, the monotone, the monochromaticness of the image, and all this kind of stuff. All these things work for the image, but the fact that you have this 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 organic human form next to all this cold black imagery. Um, that's what makes this image. And it's a wide angle lens that does it. You know, we already talked about this image where you got the guy coming through the frame. You could have shot this with a telephoto, but it wouldn't have had the same effect, not without the wide angle putting in the context. Context is so important. Uh, intimacy, you know, getting close to this subject. Uh, all these things happen. That, to me, a wide angle lens is just so much more versatile than a, a telephoto or a, a, or a quote unquote portrait lens. Um, and, and so I just, I, I, I just could never imagine not having a wide angle lens on my camera, um, or at least in my kit, and most of the time on my camera. So good question. So Matt, with your traveling, do you take a bunch of lenses with you, or only take your one go-to lens with you? Uh, no, no, I I take I I don't travel light. Um, I always find it funny when when people talk about how light they travel, and I don't travel light. I would like to. It would be fun to. My back would love it. My back would thank me for it, but I don't. Uh, which is part of why I went with Fuji. And then the irony is now I'm shooting a GFX half the time, and so it's heavy. So, um, but, 
the, the reality for me is I'm either teaching or I'm shooting for an assignment. Rarely do I shoot for myself. Okay. So if I'm teaching, I need a lot of gear because I'm teaching. So I, I have lenses people borrow. I have lenses to talk about. I have, so I have a lot of gear. When I'm shooting an assignment, I need everything that I can get in my kit so that I have what I need for that assignment. And so, and so I take, I'll take, uh, but reality is um, when I do travel, I usually take, um, I will take my um, uh, 1024. I'll take the, um, the 50, uh, 52, 1.2. And then I'll take the, 70 to 200. These are all if I'm shooting uh, the X series. If I'm shooting GFX, I really only have two lenses for my GFX. I have the 3264 and I have the 110. So, um, but the interesting thing is, is I always take both cameras. So I have this massive GFX and then I also have my X-T3. Um, and these days, now I'm shooting the X-100V, which is a lens in itself in a sense in other words it's a it's a fixed lens so um but but i don't i don't travel light uh i use off-camera flashes i use an 8400 8600 sometimes i use an 8200 godox these are massive flashes with big soft boxes and everything like that i mean uh i i have worked with young photographers on assignments when i i used to have a um, a company called on field media project and uh, and I had a couple of young photographers with me that would go with me and, and we'd shoot it, shoot for NGOs. And when we did this, they would oftentimes pack super light and I would get mad at them. And I'd just say, you know, that's, you know, we're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for a client. You need to have everything that you can possibly carry because we're shooting for the client and you need the gear. You can't get there and go, oh, I wish I would have brought that. Okay, so in the chat, I've listed my email address. That's info at mattbrandonphoto.com. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. If you have suggestions that we can do next time, feel free. Um, again, sign up for my email. Uh, I think that's going to be it, unless you have any more questions. I'll hang out here for the next uh, 10 minutes. You guys are feel free. It's officially, we are done. I, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for Fujifilm for putting it on. Thanks, Kenny, for, for helping out. And uh, if any of you have any questions, I'm here for now. So feel free to ask away.